Well, we're here to, today at the IPS uh, offices interviewing Richard Harrington. Uh, Richard has had a, a long career, which we're going to uh, uh, question him about uh, regarding a uh, uh, music scene, another cultural scene here in the Washington area in the 60s and 70s and a little beyond, too. So, uh, uh, Okay, Richard. Uh, how did you come to your career in music? I mean, was there young influences in your life uh, with music? Or did you discover it later? I think the best word would be accidentally. Um, I did not plan on a career in journalism. Um, I never finished high school. I didn't spend a day in college because um, the 60s were much more interesting to be in the middle of than having to go to classes and carry books and do homework. So. Uh, those were those were experiences that I didn't have, but the experiences that I had were incredibly valuable, as I may have mentioned. Um, I was identified early on as being bright, and I ended up going to these schools that were extremely um, academically rigorous, boarding schools, all boys schools, uh, basically from the second grade through the tenth. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was accentuated there was writing skills and I had some wonderful teachers mm -hmm. and mentors including John Hersey uh, who encouraged me to keep journals to write down my thoughts to formulate my thoughts when I did pretty much anything um, and somehow I balanced that with playing a lot of sports too um, so I think that was sort of ingrained in me but I never thought about a, being a writer, I, I, I don't know how many people that young, 10th grade, 11th grade, are, are really thinking about that. Um, I finally came back having decided that I was tired of being in isolated boys' schools and I wanted to go to a public school, so I came back here to Washington where I lived with my mother and sister and went to Woodrow Wilson High School, got kicked out of there, too much freedom too soon. Um, went to the next year to an experimental school called the Hawthorne School, dropped out of there. It's hard to drop out of an experimental school. And finally went to what is now Ellington High School, was then Western High School, and sort of after three years finished with my junior year um, and didn't get kicked out or drop out. And uh, the following year, my senior year, I dropped out about a month before graduation because by then, the 60s were in full bloom and so was I. Um, so I decided that uh, that's what I would prefer to do. And I've never regretted it. Um, I sometimes wonder what it would have been like to spend at least a day in college. Um, but I never had that experience. So the 60s came along and that's how I sort of became involved in the counterculture. Musically, I'd been a folk singer, one of the schools that I was at. I was in a Kingston Trio folk-like group with Loudon Wainwright. I taught him how to play guitar, which is why he's still a lousy guitar player. <laughs> um, but you know, he's made a, he made a career out of music, and I sometimes wonder if I had pursued it, would that have been my fate as well? Some people thought I was pretty good. I never did. I sang other people's songs. I didn't really write my own. Um, I was a good interpreter, and you know, that was you could be a good interpreter back in those days. This is you know, the mid-60s. I played a lot of hoots around town. Around there, DC. Yeah. Here in D.C., played the Salador Hoot Nannies, opened for Dave Van Ronk. I mean, you know, th there were all sorts of interesting situations, but I didn't see that as a calling. That was more sort of like fun. How were you as a guitar player? I was a decent guitar player. I wasn't a great guitar player. Um, I was a very emotive singer. Um, I was very convincing. Um, but at the same time, I, I didn't see that happening. What happened, the, the confluence of writing and music occurred gradually after having done some sort of office work for the Washington Free Press. I somehow ended, the details are a little sketchy, I'm sorry. Uh, I ended up as part of the original group of people over at Quicksilver Times. And Which was about 19... 60, no, that's 1969, yeah. I think. Um, and, oh, I forgot uh, another important factor. 
1968, just before I turned 21, I was arrested for selling drugs to an undercover, for selling marijuana, which is not really a drug. Um, anyways, for selling marijuana to an undercover cop, and I ended up going to trial later in 68 and ended up being sentenced to 20 months to five years in prison at Lorton. I got out after a few months because they decided that was an excessive sentence for a nickel of marijuana. First yeah, offense. Morton. Yeah. Man. And then to make life even more interesting, that summer I ended up in a group called the Garrick Players, which was a theater group in Georgetown in the old Dumbarton Church. So I got to say, you know, I, I did lights and I, I did lots of different little technical stuff there, but I also acted in one play where I said a couple of lines so that on my resume, if I were ever to write one, I could say, briefly acted with Susan Sarandon and Chris Sarandon in the Garrick Players. She had just graduated. They had both just graduated from Catholic University. There were no films in their future at that point. So, you know, this is, I was all around the arts and creative people, musicians, part of that whole folk circle. Not so much rock and roll, but, you know, the, the sort of folk and country type stuff. So then I went to Lorton, and when I came out, I felt like I had to work because I didn't like having been locked up. Being locked up and not being able to do anything for a long period of time and thinking when I went in there that I was going to be there at least 20 months made me realize the value of personal freedom. So when I got out, I became a workaholic, and gradually I started becoming more involved with different papers. I wrote for the Washington Star, which was the, the uh, afternoon paper here for many years before it folded. Then a friend of mine who I'd known from the folk circuit, he'd run a coffee house called The Unicorn, at 17th and R, Elliot Ryan. Um, he had started a paper called Unicorn Times, and uh, after I had briefly moved up to Woodstock and come back, I became its editor, he remained its publisher, and it became a really, really good newspaper because it attracted a lot of very talented people, a lot of very knowledgeable people, a lot of very passionate people. And we were printing 96 pages every month. It was full of ads because the community supported it. And um, so I did that for a bunch of time. Then I started writing for the Post as a freelancer. And then I pretty much went there full time after 1980. Let me uh, back up a little because uh, you, before uh, all your uh, late 60s, you had been involved in some social activism. Or I had, not in, in you know, not in the way that some people were fully involved. Yeah. Uh, I lived in McLean Gardens, which is on Wisconsin Avenue, uh, close to American University, and McLean Gardens at the time was segregated. I was 13 years old and there started to be these uh, actions where there would be picketing at the main entrance to McLean Gardens every night from I think it was like 6 to 9 or something like that uh, to integrate McLean Gardens and I started going up there and also ended up going out to Glen Echo which the amusement park that was also segregated at the time. I was 13, 14. Uh, I looked much older, and so I think, you know, nobody thought it was odd to see a kid because, you know, I didn't look like a kid. Um, eventually, it got us kicked out of McLean Gardens, and, um, you know, so I, I, I saw a consequence, but that was sort of the, the white liberal consequence. Gee, you get kicked out of McLean Gardens for picketing for integration. However, it was my first encounter with committed and sort of biracial activists uh, working for a common goal. So that was, you know, I think that had an impact on me. And then, of course, during the Vietnam War, there was a lot of actions that I was involved in. The Chicago 7 um, had their, their meetings at the Quicksilver offices when they were in Washington. And as a matter of fact, and I'm sure other people have probably talked about this, the CIA planted at least one person, Sal Ferreira, a.k.a. Sal Torrey, uh, on the staff. And then it later turned out that about half the people on the staff worked for either the FBI, the CIA, or the Metropolitan Police Department, which 
when you think about it, it's very kind of them, but yeah. apparently they were so concerned, even though the paper was not particularly dangerous or certainly not as dangerous as it thought it was or, or wanted to be. Mm -hmm. Gee, I didn't know they were so good at newspapers. <laughs> uh, well, Sal was a very good writer. Uh, you know, he had, he had a lot of, uh, of good articles, as I recall. And, you know, I, I don't know who the other undercover people were. I saw one not too long ago in a, walking to a building near where I currently live in Tacoma Park, and I hadn't seen him in like 25, 30 years. Hmm. And I said, hey, how you doing? He says, yeah, I live down here in the building. And when I went down to visit him a few days later, he'd moved. So he may still be undercover for somebody or other, but that was bizarre. Um, and of course, what I'm leaving out here is at Quicksilver, you know, that that was a much more radical paper than uh, most alternative papers are. It was definitely a, you know, committed leftist, communist. It, it had a lot of issues that I was not particularly in tune with. How did it differ in your view from the Washington Free Press, uh, which I understood was more yippee oriented? Yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, but a lot of a lot of towns were going through that uh, that dichotomy between having two papers, one of which was more the hippie counterculture, the other one was more sort of the leftist activist, hardcore radical type newspaper, mm -hmm. and I think that Quicksilver saw itself in that place, mm -hmm. and um, and. As it moved that way, the, the, the politics of it, and particularly uh, the sort of the, the counterinsurgency aspects, I think there was a lot of disruption that was going on that led them to become even sort of more oddly authoritarian in how it was run by Terry Becker in particular. And, uh, you know, so you have to live in the commune. I never lived in the commune. Um, you know, it, it, I, that's where I did my first writing. Um, was there? Okay. Yes, Embar or, or hopefully people can't find can't find too many of the stories because I remember writing about Easy Rider and something along the lines of brothers and sisters. This film is about us. So uh, I progressed. <laughs> Richard, you referred to a little while back um, that you didn't care to go to college because the '60s came was far more interesting. Can you describe a little what it was like to? Be to be in Washington, D.C., returning to Washington, D.C. in the mid-60s, I guess it would have been, right? What yeah. was it like? You know, I, I ended up living, I was living in Georgetown by that time. Um, my mom had rented a house uh, on Volta Place, just down the street from the police station, oddly enough, um, and across from a playground where it turns out that there have been lots of bodies buried over the years, which they only found out recently. So much interesting history gets interrelated. Um, anyways, so I lived there, and this is when I was going to Western, and now Ellington. Um, and I just liked the, I think the, the, the free spiritedness of the era. There were a lot of little head shops in, in, in Georgetown and around DuPont Circle, you know, leather places. I'm not talking about the S&M type, I'm talking yeah. leather clothing. Um, there was just a, a sort of a very friendly spirit and there were drugs. And you know, this is when LSD was legal, I think up until 66 or 67, I forget exactly what year. Um, so, you know, it's legal, take it. Um, do we need to take a break, by the way? Are we running time? No, you're good. Okay. Um, edit that out. Um, so, you know, and, and grass, you know, the, the, the least destructive drug of all time. So to participate in that culture, plus the sexual revolution that was going on at the time, being younger, skinnier, and a lot healthier and energetic, I fully participated. Um, with no regrets and frequent trips to the Washington Free Clinic, so frequent that I ended up being a volunteer there. Um, so I, I think the there was a sense of of, of a countercultural community that um, was very close. I mean, people knew each other. We we go we'd end up at the same concerts. 
we'd see each other on the streets, uh, walking up and down the street. <laughs> Sorry. But maybe the president. I have to take this. <laughs> Is that okay? Mr. President, I'll have to call you back, but yes, I will serve. <laughs> I try to do it as authentically as possible. <laughs> Barack, I told you not to call me here. Yep. Uh, Didn't your uh, secretary pass on my schedule? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, uh, well, you remember that that yeah. that whole era was a really yeah, fun was, era. It was fun. It was just what you described. Very friendly, mm -hmm. open. I had a little. There's a lot of all night places. Oh, too. There were, absolutely. Yeah, still rolling. Yeah. yeah. Grits and there's all night drugs. Yeah, there, yeah. As a matter of fact, there's a picture of me from the night after I got out of jail after being arrested, where I'm sitting at the counter mm -hmm. at the what was then People's Drug Store cafeteria in Georgetown, um, looking kind of suspicious, I must say, <laughs> but. Uh, Still, it was a place where you could go. There, there were there were lots of places. There were clubs, all up and down Wisconsin and M Street, and um, it was a lot of fun. Our uh, researcher came across an interesting thing. Uh, speaking of fun, were you open for the Who on one occasion? Yes, uh, my friend. Tell us about that. <laughs> my I was at that concert, by the way. Well, you didn't hear me because nobody hear heard you. me. Uh, my friend Mike Schreiben, who uh, was a promoter at the time and is currently the head of the Washington Area Music Association, put on that concert at McDonough Arena. And there were, as there often were with the Who, troubles uh, with people having uh, entered without paying for a ticket and uh, it was way overcrowded and they were backstage dickering with Mike about extra money and Mike was having to figure out a way to kill time and he knew me from my days as a folk singer so he asked me to go out there with a, a an acoustic guitar and I think they shone a spotlight on me but thank goodness they didn't turn on the microphone and so it looked like something was going on, and that was apparently just enough to distract the people and stop there being a riot. Um, so many years later, I, I'd had another encounter when The Who played up at Meriwether Post Pavilion. I think it was the, the following year. About 35,000 people showed up, and the place only holds 20. And so there was traffic going almost up to Baltimore on 29 and almost back to Washington on 29. And because I was doing the, the underground paper at the time, I was asked to become the MC. So I became like wavy gravy and went out, you know, brothers and sisters, try and clear the aisles, you know. I, I, did, I don't think I made anything like the yellow acid is really good or anything like that. But I, I just tried to, to keep order. So many years later, I interviewed Pete. Townsend for the you know for the Washington Post and reminded him of both incidents and he was rolling on the floor with laughter at both uh, which he didn't remember of course and you know because he wasn't really there he he was probably backstage dickering for money at Merriweather as well um, but you know again technically I opened for the Who so <laughs> technically one night at the cellar door at a folk at a folk hoot nanny. Jack Boyle, who was the owner, played a little joke on me. He told me he was going to have this comedian who was in town. He was going to, it, could he just have a few minutes before I played, you know, my set? A uh, nanny, you know, it's a short set. So I said, sure. So, you know, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Richard Pryor. <laughs> so technically I could also say Richard Pryor opened for me. Uh, you know, technically there are a lot of truths that are absolute lies, but... You know, they're they're fun to tell. Mm -hmm. In that period in the late '60s, what where did your own musical taste? What did you particularly like? Uh, well, I'd started I'd started out of the folk movement. You know, I'd started with embarrassingly the Kingston Trio and Chad Mitchell Trio, and then quickly moved on to the Folkways catalog, and then became aware of the holdings down at the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. So you know, I moved on to uh, you know prestige Folkways. The, you know, the labels that had great blues and authentic folk and stuff like that. Um, and then into rock and roll. And uh, 
uh, you know, uh, I think a natural progression in some ways. And then, of course, the great joy of my life as a writer was to be able to write about all those things. I could write about jazz, I could write about blues, um, and I had the experience of actually encountering and interviewing many, many amazing creative spirits. You were always big uh, on, on uh, uh, local bands, local performers. Uh, yeah, I, partly well. because I'd been a local musician on the right. folk circuit, mm -hmm. and you know, then had hung out at a lot of uh, a, lo a lot of clubs that had local bands playing in them. Some of which, you know, later went on to become much better known. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, and I always thought that any newspaper, and it's much easier when you're an alternative newspaper than when you're the mainstream daily, should offer as much support and uh, publish as much information as possible about your local creative talent mm -hmm. and uh, their aspirations and achievements and whatever. So, it's much easier to do when you control the paper, and Unicorn Times in particular was meant to be a uh, uh, very heavily local coverage mixed in with national acts as well but you know probably 50 to 60 percent at least of our coverage was localized and uh, it was also a reflection of the fact that the support we got was from local clubs and a lot of bands took out advertisements you know with their own schedules and new releases and you know record stores I mean it, it, it definitely was a community type effort and that started to a certain extent with Woodwind but Woodwind was also poetry and fiction and, and articles that we picked up from other newspapers around the world, some often without permission, um, that we thought were interesting to our readers as part of the counterculture. Tell us about Woodwind, when did that start? Uh, I think Woodwind technically started around 68. Uh, a lot of those 60s uh, years you, you sort of need a graph sometimes to specifically remember when things took place. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess tech, I guess m it was probably actually 69 because uh, Quicksilver started in, in early 69 and I was there probably about a year so 69 or 70 would have been the time that I started Woodwind and I started it specifically because I didn't think that there was enough cultural coverage in uh, Quicksilver and I thought that the cultural coverage, like much of its coverage, was too narrow um, in, in its overview, and I wanted something a little bit different. So uh, I actually borrowed $500 from the sign of Jonah, mm -hmm. which was a Christian head shop on P Street. I have no idea how I ended up there, uh, but they, they gave me $500, and we put out the first issue, and then it sort of took off from there. It was never usually successful in the sense that, uh, that Unicorn Times was. Unicorn Times, at its peak, was doing 60,000 copies a month, free, and a thick paper, 96 pages. Woodwind was never that, that uh, solid. And it's better remembered the less you actually get to look at it, uh, like some memories are. Um, sometimes when I look at it, I realize how embarrassingly bad it was in terms of production uh, and layout, because I was doing a lot of that myself, and I had no training in any of that. Again, Unicorn became a much better paper when people who knew what they were doing took over those responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So, um, so Unicorn was basically yours, so well, a lot of help, but you were... Well, I didn't start it, but I yeah. made it. The I'm sorry, I'm, I meant Woodwind. Wood, Woodwind. Yeah, Woodwind I, I, I started yeah. and I sort of co-started it with Mike Schreiben, the promoter. Mm -hmm. We used to operate out of his apartment on 35th Street. Um, I mean, that's how big an operation it was. It was put together in somebody's one-bedroom apartment. You'd review uh, theater, movies? Uh, in Woodwind it was mostly, there, there were reviews of records, films, some theater, some sort of off-the-cuff articles about classical music by Stephen Allen Wheelton, who was a, quite the genius. There was photography, there were photo essays, um, there was poetry, people like Grace Cavalieri published there pretty regularly. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure that 
other than it being sort of an arts paper, that it had the focus that Unicorn would later have. But people seem to remember it fondly, and as I say, I think they remember it more fondly the, the less they can actually pinpoint an issue and look at it. So mm -hmm. I know that when I look at it, I'm somewhat embarrassed because I know that the distance between what could have been done and what was done was great. So Unicorn started in about 73? <laughs> so. About 73 or 74 and used to be a small folded up newspaper. And uh, when I came back in 1976 um, from having lived up in New York for a couple of years, uh, I was asked to become sort of the editor and became the managing editor and then I uh, I sort of took it over and Elliot was always the publisher but everybody saw it as my paper mostly because I'm the one who coordinated everything and assigned all the stories designed the basic paper and edited it and did all that kind of stuff sold half the advertising um, but again that paper was great because it was a reflection of the communal spirit behind it so many good writers so many knowledgeable writers so many passionate writers, photographers, a lot of people, you know, got their first exposure and opportunities in that particular paper. Such as? And, well, uh, Joe Sasfi, who worked at the Mitre Corporation, which was some kind of think tank as far as I know, um, I got a letter from him one day, which I still have, He's, and I, I always do his voice because, hello, this is Joe Sasfi. Uh, I'm currently uh, an um, et cetera at the Mitre Corporation, but I have an ongoing and lifelong passion for rock and roll, and I'd like to write for the Unicorn Times. So he became Dr. Rock and Roll uh, under his name, writing under his name, but you know, he, so he became Doc. And uh, he did some brilliant stuff. Later on, he, I got him to do some stuff for the Post, but then he became sort of the creative director at Time Life Records based on his exposure and clear knowledge of music and put together all those fantastic compilation series that they did. Um, very, very successful at it. Uh, as I said, you know, and then a lot of other people, Mark Jenkins, who's, you know, currently, you know, quite the star <laughs> as a freelancer at The Post, uh, he didn't get his start there, but he was a frequent contributor. There were a lot of very, very good writers who, uh, you know, who made that paper what it was. It, I was the great coordinator, but you know, it, w it was their paper. When did it end and why did it end? <clears throat> I left in 1980 because there were some issues with the IRS and control of the paper and um, responsibilities that I didn't feel that I could become involved in because I was a relatively new dad at that point. Mm -hmm. And I had to have, you know, the, the sudden reality of, gee, I need a real job and a home and all this kind of stuff. So I left and the paper kept going for another maybe three years or four years. And again, it, it wasn't quite as good as when I was there, but it was still a pretty good paper still had a lot of good writers, still covered the local scene with great passion. So it kept going for, you know, for three or four years afterwards and then eventually just folded. Did, did you and Ryan have a good relationship? Or was it we had an interesting relationship. Mm -hmm. um, he was not a great business person in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was the main problem ultimately on why I left. But you know, he started it. He had the Unicorn Coffee House, which was, uh, you know, one of the very first coffee houses here in Washington at 17th and R. I think there's a laundromat uh, or a laundry there now. And uh, I don't know if you ever remember yeah, going there. Easy. Yeah. And he lived above it. And I sometimes, when I was home from school, I would, you know, I would crash there when I was still very young. Um, and again, I could be 15 or 16 and be welcome in these circles, partly because I looked older and acted older, but also because it was a welcoming environment. I'm sorry, I keep talking. It's okay, it's okay. Um, of all the places you've talked about where you heard music, and I heard music in all those places myself, I think, what were your favorite places to go and just hear music to enjoy them in those years, 60s and 70s? Very early, 
the Bohemian Caverns mm -hmm. because it was such a cool place, you know, the little grotto caverns, yeah. stalactites or mites or whichever they are, coming down out of the ceiling, and some amazing local music, Andrew White and the JFK Quintet, Cannonball, Adderley Sextet, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it was... It was Nancy Lewis, right? Yeah, because he recorded the yeah. the in crowd there. Um, so that was cool. It was an intimate room, and it was just, you know, it's like what I'd like my man cave to be like, you know, if I had a man cave. So the cellar door, because I had sung there, but also as I started my career, both at the Star and then later at the at the Post, I, I always used to prefer not to sit at at a table, but to sit on the steps that led down to the stage because it just felt like a different point of view. I didn't feel like a customer. I felt, and I got to know a lot of musicians that way. Jack Boyle, who then became incredibly powerful uh, concert promoter and finally sold Cellar Door for $110 million in 1990-something, um, was the bartender when I first started hanging out there. Um, Blues Alley to a certain extent, but the Child Herald was a fabulous place. The first time Bruce Springsteen played, he played the Child Herald, and I remember him unplugging his guitar and having them turn off the air conditioning, and him walking from the front of the club to the back of the club, and then back strumming on his guitar, and all you could hear with the, with the tinny strings, and him singing, I don't remember what song it was, but that was his first appearance here in D.C. So. There was a lot of great musicians. I played drums with Steve Miller there one night. The only time in my life I've ever played drums. I'm glad there are no recordings because I'm sure that I was such a terrible drummer. But somehow or other, I had ended up spending the day with Steve, taking him to some TV shows to talk to people. And we got progressively drunk and high. And at the end of the night, we ended up at the club. And that's where I made my one and only appearance on drums. Um, nobody said anything, so I, you know, probably to spare my feelings. But again, those opportunities would not have come about except in, the, in that kind of era and as a result of having grown up in that 60s culture where anything went. Were there some local musicians from that time that you saw highly of that just never quite made it? I mean, we, I, I don't. Well, yeah, and oddly enough, there was a club called Emergency in Georgetown, which Mike Schreiben operated. It was run by a bunch of kids as a non-profit, non-alcoholic club. And a number of years ago, I guess it was 20 years ago now, we did sort of a reunion, and I printed up all the old stories on local musicians that we had run in Woodwind, and a number of those bands got back together and played at the Bayou. So, so it was the Emergency Woodwind reunion at the Bayou. Okay, we're rolling. Um, okay, so obviously in the 60s and 70s, music, journalism, and, and culture had a really close relationship. And I was just wondering like, how you saw that relationship form and kind of how the three interacted and in terms of like cultural construction or like merely reflecting culture, things like that. It's kind of an abstract question. But. Well, when, when I was starting these alternative papers, you know, there was no Rolling Stone. There was Crawdaddy first. Um, and later on, you know, when Rolling Stone started, it was so new and so different that it just stood apart from any other magazines, you know, apart from Cream, apart from Hit Parader or any of the other, you know, alleged music magazines. And it had the, the best mix of music writing and social and political writing as well which it's now returned to, oddly enough, although music may be the weakest part of its you know, content these days. But uh, to, you know, to watch the, the rise of that particular institution was amazing. I never wrote for them. Uh, I was asked a bunch of times and oddly enough was not interested for no particular reason. Um, so I think, that, but it became an incredibly valuable tool, and it was uh, not only inspirational but aspirational at the same time in terms of what it could do as a magazine. So I think it's an incredibly important, you know, process to have been through, and it was interesting to watch something like that start from the beginning to its current state. 
No, because they, I mean, obviously they, they had a, a sort of a West Coast inclination. I wouldn't call it necessarily a bias. But from the start, you know, their intention was to be, you know, a national and ultimately international, but essentially national music publication. So, you know, they were not quite so Catholic. I think people who lived in San Francisco even more than L.A. tended to get coverage because, you know, it's your neighborhood, you know, it's your local band in many ways, but also that was an epicenter of music during those that first decade or so in particular, so that was a natural inclination for them to, to lean that way. Um, but yeah, no, I, I never thought of it as being anything more than a national paper that had a local leaning. And from the beginning, Rolling Stone had the, uh, the Rolling Stone interview, the first one with Bonvin, and they interviewed Dylan so many times. Um, what kind of, what place do you see like the musicians taking in the cultural change in the 60s and 70s? Because I know you interviewed a lot later. Um, yeah, well, what Rolling Stone showed is, is was it was possible to have long, coherent conversations with musicians in which they got to talk about not just what they were doing, but what they wanted to do, what they hoped to do, what they were trying to do, what they aspired to do, how they did it. Uh, the long extended interviews that Rolling Stone was particularly known for became a model. You never saw those kind of interviews in, in papers like The Post, you know, until Rolling Stone started doing them. You'd, you'd see little featurettes about bands, but everything was slight. Rolling Stone made everything deeper, I think, for, uh, for newspapers in terms of their music coverage. Just, uh, uh, I guess that since we're nearing wrapping up, uh, we sort of slighted your uh, career at the Post because you know it wasn't until the '60s and '70s you you went there. Uh, uh, you were a freelancer for them for a time in the late '70s. Right? right. I started in '76 as a freelancer. I think my first review was the Osmonds at what was then the Capitol Center. Oh, how was that? Uh, I've <laughs> gladly forgotten. <laughs> um, it was all uphill. Or down, no, it was all uphill from there, um, and I, I started essentially full time in the in the early '80s, and then retired 2008. Um, so, considering that I did not think about this as a career, I consider myself incredibly fortunate to have had a long career in a field that most people would think of as play, um, and it certainly wasn't because I worked really hard at what I did, but. I can think of about every other job <laughs> that would have been far less interesting for me. So, one, one little anecdote you told off camera, I'd like you to tell us about your seat at the post, uh, where you where you sat uh, in the style section. In the style section, uh, I sat almost. I was the first person you'd see when you'd walk into the style section which I never quite understood because I'm not sure that I'd be the first person I'd want to see if I walked into a, a newspaper, into a section. Um, but two desks over was Nina Hyde, our great fashion editor and fashion guru. And um, then, as now, and in my entire life, I have never been a person that fashion can do anything for. Uh, and I've never thought about it. And generally speaking, I'm a total embarrassment to the word fashion. But Nina would have various designers come in and, you know, visit with her and, you know, as they'd be getting ready to go to lunch or whatever. And they would come in and people like Carl Lagerfeld or, you know, some of these other folks would come in and they'd stand by her desk. And the, the way they'd stand is they'd be looking past her and right at me. And I'm sure that there was like tremors and shocks that they were experiencing thinking, oh my God, you know, what is that? Um, or variations thereof. But Nina always seemed to get a kick out of it. She thought it was very funny because, you know, these people were always in, impeccably dressed mm -hmm. and well-mannered. And uh, I'm afraid that this is probably the cleanest that I've looked in some time. So you can imagine what <laughs> their reactions were. It always amazed me that more people didn't say anything about that because uh, I definitely did not fit the company man mold, but Nina seemed to get a kick out of getting their reactions from time to time. Yeah, I, I 
that's because the post was very strict on. I mean, they'd be asking, why aren't you wearing a tie? This sort of thing. To I think they. Had, I did. think they accepted. Well, <laughs> they were never that, that strict, were, to tell you the truth. You know, obviously, if you were going to the White House, you'd be wearing right. a suit. Uh, and when I did go to the White House a few times, I did wear a suit. Uh, and could make myself look a little bit like Pavarotti if I worked at it, but um, other than, you know that was just to cover usually a musical event, and uh, you know I managed I could pass. When you did come to the post, I understand that it caused a great elation among a lot of local musicians because the, the post suddenly was covering a lot more of local musicians. The post always covered a fair amount of local stuff. I, maybe they covered a little bit more when I was there but or when I first... Friday, uh, well, in the, the Friday weekend section, you know, we always made sure that we tried to cover what was worth covering. We couldn't cover everything, but we, we did go out of our way, and they still go out of their way to cover local recordings and occasionally do stories on local bands mm -hmm. and, uh, and give that support. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's what a local newspaper should at least be partially about. And, you know, just meeting my responsibility. Right. So, somebody suggested you tell me this is correct or not, that uh, you would, might get a CD from some musician who would keep bugging you about the review and you wouldn't run it and you sort of had the, the secret philosophy of, if it's really bad, I'm not going to trash somebody local. Well, it wasn't quite that. Them. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't quite that simplistic. I, I saw no point if somebody sent me a, a, a CD or, or, in the old days, a record that was clearly terrible. There was no value to the reader. There was no value to the musician in simply writing about it in order to trash it. And I told people. I just told people. I don't think it meets our standards. Uh, you know, I, I, I didn't try and avoid the issue. Um, and sometimes if something had good, good aspects of it, we'd consider reviewing it and would review it and would mention both the good and the bad. I never told anybody to give local people a good review just because yeah. they were local, because that's defeating the purpose of criticism. So. And, uh, and so you were there at the Post for 20 years? 28 years. So as a staffer and then, you know, the four years as a freelancer. So. I mean, it's amazing when I think about it, that how I ended up there. Yeah, it's amazing how you ended up. How I ended up, period. <laughs> what are the, what are the, uh, we're trying to cover the 60s and 70s in this, in this project. And I wanted to ask you if you could think of the things that in those years, the 60s and 70s, that you did that you feel the most proud of or that you want people to remember. Well, I, f I think essentially that how without any particular training and with a certain amount of instinct, aspiration, and hopeless dreaming, um, I was able to be involved in the birth of several newspapers and unfortunately the demise of several others, um, though none of that was my fault, of course. Um, and I think that it, it's something that was possible. You know, you could for not a lot of money, put together a newspaper and put it out there and, you know, gather like-minded people to share their enthusiasms and you could develop an audience and eventually you could make something that approximated a living from it. Um, people today have the internet. The problem is finding an audience. That's the, that's the challenge is there's a lot of very talented people writing uh, you know, blogs or, or contributing to, you know, to some of the very, some of the online journals that are out there or whatever. But differentiating and finding an audience um, is much more difficult than it was when you had a newspaper that you could hand out on the corner or put in a store and people could pick up. Um, so I think there's greater opportunity now, but the challenge I think is also much greater. So. But there's always been there's always been incredibly talented people who will express themselves regardless of the size of their audience. And Woodwind grew from, you know, probably the first issue of fifteen hundred to a, I think the last issue was probably around twenty thousand. Unicorn grew from early issues of three or four thousand to sixty and seventy thousand at the end. And you know, those issues 
departed, same city paper now, you know, disappears very quickly. Um, it's just hard to find things on, on the web unless you know where you're going. You don't have to know where you're going to find a, new, a newspaper like City Paper. So, times are different. <laughs>